Hi guys, this is a video to help you planning your journey to Japan. I'm Andrea and I took uh, two weeks trips there for my master degree. I enjoyed a lot, so I would like to share with you my experience, helping with some tips and summarizing the tons of information you can find on the web. I traveled alone and I planned my journey on my own and to do this I mostly relied on what I found on the web and on some pieces of advice from friends who had already been there. So I understand what it means to plan your journey knowing the name of two, maybe three cities. In this video we'll discuss which should be the stop of your journey, how to travel in Japan, which should be your budget and some accommodation advice. So I won't waste more time and have a look at which should be the stops of your journey. For your first journey to Japan, I suggest to visit the central and south part of Honshu, which is the major island of Japan and also where are the famous Kanto and Kansai regions. Here are located the biggest cities as well, so I will show which ones are definitely worthy and some other possible stops. Looking deeper, cities like Tokyo, Kyoto and Osaka are a must scene. They don't need introduction and most of the people who don't like to travel constantly from a place to another just visit those three cities. This doesn't mean to see fewer things since there are plenty of daily trips you can take from those cities. From Tokyo maybe the most famous destination is Mount Fuji, which can be seen by the five lakes around it. Among these the most accessible and also beautiful is Lake Kawaguchi and near there there is also the Chureito Pagoda which probably is the most photographed spot in Japan. However, it's not so easy to experience a full view of the mountain due to the weather, and generally it's easier to see Fuji in the early mornings of autumn and winter. So pay particular attention to this to not waste your time, in fact, being very unlucky in those things, I wanted to go there, but some friends of mine went there and took fantastic pictures, while others only for the rain. Watch out that if you want to clean Mount Fuji, generally it's possible only from July to September. Another trip you can take is to Nikko, where is the mausoleum of Tokugawa Ieyasu, the founder of Tokugawa Shogunate, which ruled Japan for almost 300 years until the late 19th century. So he was pretty rich and not so humble, leaving a quite good grave. Instead, in my journey, I decided to visit Kamakura where is the great Buddha that in past time was the second tallest statue of him in Japan. Kamakura is pretty, on the sea and with some nice walking trains surrounded by mountains, temples and shrines. And it's less than an hour from Tokyo. So nothing special, but to visit something very close to the city is fine. Last, also Hakone could be worthy to enjoy the onsen, the famous hot springs scattered all around Japan. From Kyoto and Osaka, which are quite near, you must go to Nara, which was the ancient capital of Japan, full of historical temples and shrines. Here there are a lot of big things, such as the biggest wooden building in the world, the Todaiji, which houses the biggest Daibutsu in Japan. This and other temples are located in a huge and nice park, full of friendly deers you can feed. Other trips could be to Mount Koya, one of the most sacred places for Japanese Buddhism and also Himeji could be worthy, whose castle is considered to be Japan's most beautiful surviving feudal castle. If you want to travel more in the south, I highly recommend Miyajima, a little island in front of Hiroshima. This island is universally known for its famous floating Tori gate and its beautiful temples, surrounded by the nature and the deers which live on the island. During the day it's a very touristy and so crowded place, but if you will sleep there at night you can fully enjoy the silent, mysticism and peace of this island. Watch out, the Tori will be under renovation work from June 2019. Even if I hadn't the time to visit Hiroshima, friends tell me it's a beautiful city and so also one day there is worth it. Back to the north, in the Japanese Alps, I love Takayama, despite the cold. Located in a valley, surrounded by the wood, this city was famous for its carpenters, and in the streets, through the houses and the temples, you can really taste the traditional Japan, and some good sake as well, since there are some famous breweries here. Kanazawa, instead, in my opinion, is a step below the others, 
First of all, uh, since it's one of the most rainy places in Japan. But uh, if you can visit it, don't miss the chance. Since there, I saw what I consider the most beautiful park in Japan. And, as I hope you will see, there's plenty of competition about parks in Japan. Last but not the least, Gear Olsen. Back to the Japanese Alps, I go there since it's famous for its hotels with hot springs and a huge dinner, and I enjoy both a lot. But I was the only Western people in the hotel, and also when I told I visited Gero to a local in Kyoto, he was a little surprised. So maybe it's rather a destination for Japanese people. In the city, the only things to do is enjoy the onsen, so for me it was perfect and I absolutely recommend to take a similar experience in Gero or in another place, since there are also other more touristic destinations. So these are the major destinations in Honshu and all the city can be seen in one or maximum two days with except Tokyo and Kyoto, where at least three days are required. I didn't like so much Osaka, but most of the people I met found it amazing so if you like a city more devoted to nightlife, but to be clear, it's still Japanese nightlife with less place to visit, you can spend more days there, especially for the local food. Back to my journey, I landed at the Haneda airport in Tokyo and I spent four nights there, three days I visited the city and the last one I had a day trip to Kamakura. Then I took the train and headed towards the other coast on the Sea of Japan, arriving in Kanazawa. The next day I moved in Gifu Prefecture in the Northern Alps and here I stayed one night in Takayama. Then I went to Geronsen, spending another night there. Thus I headed south, arriving in Osaka, and after a night in the city I went to Miyajima, boarding the ferry to reach the island. Lastly, I had my final stop before coming back to Italy in Kyoto. Here I spent 5 nights, but actually I visited the city in 3 days, because I spent most of the first days in Miyajima and the last one to get to the airport to catch my flight. In the middle I also had a 1 day trip to Nara. At the end of my journey I went home from the Kansai International Airport near Osaka. So this should help you at least to define which cities are you interested and to find more about them, what to do and what to see, I suggest to check on japaguide.com, a very well made website which provides a list and a brief description of the main attractions in each city. Lastly, in my journey I really understood how much Tokyo is different from the rest of Japan. This was my favorite city and I suggest to reverse my itinerary, keeping Tokyo as your final stop. In this way, you will have full time to enjoy the rural and traditional side of Japan without the feeling that something is missing, as I did, and only in the end you will see the modern and metropolitan version of this country developed in Tokyo. So now let's talk about how to move in the cities and between the cities you will choose. Traveling from one city to the others is terribly easy in Japan since all the major cities are connected by the Shinkansen, the bullet trains, that are fast and very comfortable. Then there is plenty of local and express trains, all efficient and perfect as the myth of a Japanese railways would be. To plan your journey you can use Hyperdia.com which is a website only about the Japanese train schedule and it has also its app. However, once in Japan, I found out that Google Maps is simply fantastic about public transportation and uh, I ended up using only that. I made this choice for three reasons. The first is that on Google Maps you can find all the things that are in Upper Dia. The second is that the Google Maps provides you also metro and bus options, so you can use it also to travel in the cities. And the third is that I find far easier to plan my movements visualizing the route on a map but also Hyperdia was fine, so it's up to you. One thing you will learn soon about Japanese transportation is that in every single train station, no matter if it's a 20-track station in the center of a big city or nothing but a little house lost in the mountains, work at least two person, even where most of the times their major occupation is to welcome the passengers. So also expect to spend some money in transport 
since they are quite expensive. If you are planning to visit more than one big city and its surroundings, it's definitely worth it to buy a JR Pass, which for one or two or three weeks, depending the one you choose, allows unlimited rides on all the transports operated by Japan Railways. In short, this means all the Shinkansen line for the stops we talked previously, except the Nozomi and Minzuho lines, which depart from Osaka. But this is not a problem, since other Shinkansen lines, the Hikari and Sakura, have the same route of Nozomi and Mizuho, and they simply take a little more. Then, in the JR Pass there are also some autobus lines and a ferry from Hiroshima to Miyajima. But for traveling in the city the pass is quite useless, since maybe except Osaka, most of the autobus and subway lines aren't operated by JR so you will need to buy a ticket for them. So let's say the lower bound for making the JR pass worthy is having a round trip from Tokyo to Kyoto in one week. Starting from this, the more you will travel on JR lines in that week, the more the pass will be worthy. For example, I activated my one week JR pass the day I left Tokyo, my first city, for Kanazawa, and it ended the day after arriving Kyoto my last city. The cost of a JR Pass depends on the currency exchanges the moment you buy it and if you want ordinary or first class service. I paid my one week pass for the ordinary class around 230 euros. It's very easy to use and to buy the pass and online there is plenty of website that explain you how to do this. The only thing I want to tell you is that you have to buy the pass in your country, so before arriving in Japan. Actually, you will buy a sort of voucher that once in Japan, you will exchange with the real ticket in one of the many JR ticket offices. In Italy, for example, you can buy the pass in two agencies, one in Milano and the other in Roma or on the web. If you choose the latter, remember that the voucher will be sent to you by post and this could require some days. To conclude, I didn't use my pass the days I was in Tokyo and Kyoto and since I didn't find anything worthy on the web about city transportation and I was getting a little bored, I simply bought the ticket every time I got on transport in those cities. So if you are like me, feel free to do the same, there were no problems and no waste of money and skip the last part of this chapter of the video. In fact, the problem is that in Japan you can only buy one day pass from transportation, but each company has its own pass. So to travel in one city in the same day, it's required to use the transports operated by different company. So you will need to buy more pass or some extra tickets. So the only pass I can suggest you is the Kyoto City Bus one day pass that allows you to travel everywhere in Kyoto and it costs less than three single tickets. Even if in the end I didn't even buy this and I don't know why. In Japan you can also buy some prepaid cards to board the public transports and I will try to make it clear what they are. Depending on the city you will buy them, they have different names, but in the end they are exactly the same thing. The most famous cards are Ikoka, Suika and Pasmo. They are only a comfort since with them you won't need to buy the ticket every time you got on a transport but for example, once you charge the card, you simply tap with it the terminal on the automatic ticket gate of a subway station to enter it. You can also use them in some restaurants and shops, but you won't get any type of discounts with these cards. You can buy them at some tickets machine in Japan and they cost 2000 yen of which 500 yen is a deposit and 5,000 and a half yen is the first amount charged on the card. The only interest discount I found out for this card is if you buy the Ikoka at your arrival at the Kansai International Airport, where for around 3,000 yen you can buy the card plus a discount ticket for the Aruka Express to get to Osaka, Kyoto or Nara. This is the so-called Ikoka and Aruka. Generally, Japan is regarded as an expensive country and it is with respect to the rest of Asia, but for an European it's more or less like home. So as an Italian, I don't consider it expensive, but simply fair. 
For my two weeks journey, I spent around 1,000 and a half euros flight excluded. This cost is divided as shown in the pie chart. So, as already said, public transports are expensive and are a significant share of the total cost, but instead I found the food quite cheap. You can also spend from 5 to 10 euros to have a fully satisfying meal thanks to a lot of takeaway and easy going places, for example the ones that sell ramen and street food. Also convenience stores sell plenty of ready to go food and they can also warm up it for you in their microwaves. And it's also quite tasty and for sure you will end up there at least one time in your holidays, more probably once a day for a reason or another. Since I travel alone, I went to restaurants very few times, so expect to spend on food more than me if you will go often. Tickets to enter museums, temples and shrines are very low, generally less than 5 euros. About souvenirs, I think that Japanese culture is intended to create tons of objects you won't bring back home, so you can find something for any budget from little item for a few euros to artisanal objects which cost hundreds of euros. Maybe accommodation is a little expensive, but except two nights in a ryokan, I slept always in hostels. I think the Japanese hostels are very nice, extremely clean and also quite comfortable, so later I will show you my favorite ones. I spent 30 euros per night as an average, but if you go to two or three star hotels, expect to spend at least the double. All these costs don't refer to the high season, which is the cherry blossom time around early April and the autumn foliage time in the mid of November, plus some national holidays such as the New Year's one, the golden week at the beginning of May and the Obon in the mid of August. If you go in the cherry blossom period, you can expect to easily spend in accommodation one and a half or the double we spend in low season but in my opinion, for the beauty of that time, this is definitely worth it. Due to my commitments, I had to travel in the mid of March, which is not that bad since you can see the spring coming in the beautiful Japanese gardens and also some cherries in blossom if you are lucky, but the weather wasn't so good. Not cold, not raining, but cloudy for the most of the time. So if I had to choose when to travel avoiding the high season, I would have gone in May. So now it's time to conclude the video, I hope you enjoyed it and I will briefly show you some accommodation and pieces of advice. Let's start with the 3 best hostels in which I stayed. As I already said, if you want to save some money, feel free to sleep in Japanese hostels, since they are very good, clean and comfortable, for being hostels of course. So the first one is the Kizuna Hostel in Kyoto. Kizuna means make a stronger relationship and indeed I felt like home here. I simply love this place. The structure is entirely new and the common room is made to keep people together. The atmosphere here is very relaxing and familiar and they love the music they played. At dinner you can listen to some energetic pop and j-pop while at night classical music. After dinner I invite you to try their sake degustation while chilling in the common room. The staff is very nice and I spend some good time speaking with them and in the, my last day in Japan they simply saved my life when I almost lost my flight. In fact, in Italy my brother emptied my prepaid car by his own stuff on Amazon without saying anything to me. The second one is the Kaosan Tokyo Samurai Hostel, less new than Kizuna but still nice. The common room is characteristic but don't go there if you have problem with your knees. In particular, I love the neighborhood. Asakusa is a quiet and traditional zone, where is the oldest and most famous temple of Tokyo, the Sensuji. In the streets of this area, forget the neon lights, the skyscraper and the crowd of Shibuya Shinjuku that you can visit while wandering during the day and welcome the little shops and the rice lamps, except for the Don Quixote, the discount chain store famous for crowding its store floor to ceiling and where you can literally find anything you need and you don't. The third is the Sora Ama Hostel in Takayama. Deep in the small center of the city, it's another quiet place, lovely, and its staff is very helpful in suggesting what to do in Takayama. If you want to try Pachinko, the famous gambling game in Japan, head just to the other part of the street at the Ebis Cafe, 
where for 500 yen you can play it just for fun and you will receive souvenirs, food sake instead of money if you win and you will meet and be teached in how to play by the super nice staff of this place. Lastly, keep in mind to spend at least one night in a ryokan, the typical Japanese inn, where you will sleep in a futon over the tatami, the traditional floor made by rice straw. They will give you also the yukata, a casual verse of the kimono, and keep an eye if your ryokan has its own onsen, because natural hot springs aside, a lot of structure provide artificial bath. So, the video ends here. Best wishes for your journey from Andrea and if you liked the video or found it interesting or useful, please give me a like, a comment and share with your friends, since I decided to make this video only to share with you my passion about traveling and about this wonderful country. Goodbye.